Oh, uh, waiter. Yes, sir? I'll have some sardines and coleslaw, I think. Some sliced tomatoes with French dressing. And a cold bottle of Pabst Blue Ribbon. Yes, sir. Finest beer served anywhere. From Hollywood, Pabst Blue Ribbon. Finest beer served anywhere. Proudly presents... Screen Directors Playhouse, production, The Big Clock, director John Farrell, stars Ray Milland, Maureen O'Sullivan. The Hollywood Screen Directors present an adventure in time, The Big Clock, starring Ray Milland and Maureen O'Sullivan and introduced by the director of the film, Mr. John Farrell. When a taste for high adventure is combined with a brilliant intellect, the result is likely to be the stuff that screen directors are made of. In the person of our guest director tonight, we find a sailor, a soldier of fortune, a world-renowned biographer, and the creator of such thrilling films as Two Years Before the Mast, California, alias Nick Beale, and tonight's story, The Big Clock. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Farrell. Thank you. One of the most engaging forms of fiction is that nail-biting exercise known as the thriller. And, of course, the very heart of every thriller is the chase. I wanted to make the big clock because it revolves around the most bizarre chase I've ever encountered. Now, I think you should discover it for yourselves. The big clock, starring Ray Milland and Maureen O'Sullivan in the roles they originated, George and Georgette Stroud. But first of all... Listen to the other star, the clock itself, the big clock. Remorseless, without boundaries. It never stops, it never dies. Perhaps that's why Earl Janeth permitted his mania for clocks. Only time was greater than Janeth, the feudal baron of Janeth Publications, the dictator of a magazine empire, powerful, brilliant, ruthless, and in love with time. That was Earl Janeth. And I was his servant, George Stroud, editor of Crimeways Magazine. There were many magazines and many servants in the Janeth building, and while they seldom saw Janeth, they always saw his clock in the lobby. The big clock. My monument to time, George. Time, more precious than gems, more intractable than mountains. Remember that when you see the big clock. The clock tower works the machinery of time, and time is working for me. Time is working for Janeth. (laughs) Now see Steve Hagen. He wants to talk to you. Steve Hagen. Steve was Janeth's teeth and claws, his prime minister, his trigger man. From some journalistic gutter, Janeth had raised him to chief editor. You've displayed quite an unusual talent, George. I mean, your tactics in tracking down three killers in the last month. Thanks. We just think our system's a good one. Hasn't failed yet, George. Well, I just want you to know that Janeth Publications values our relationship. I hope the feeling is mutual. Yeah, yeah. I'm just crazy about the company. One more thing, George. You're leaving on your vacation tonight. Any special plans? Yep. My wife and I are going down to West Virginia on a delayed vacation. It's only taken seven years. I see. That'll be all, George. For now. (laughs) 
Mr. Stroud's office. Yes, just a moment. It's your wife. Oh, thanks, Miss Adams. Hello, Georgette. Hello, darling. I have the tickets. The train leaves at 7.20. Right. Meet you at the station. George, you sure you won't let anything happen? Now, what could happen? Oh, I'm afraid of Janet. We've made plans so many times before, and every time he's made you stay. Please, not this time. Not a chance. Who's more important, my wife or my boss? Who is, George? You, Dopey. Now, say goodbye. I'll meet you at 7.20. Goodbye, darling. Bye. George. Yes, Steve. Sorry, George. I just talked to Mr. Janet. He wants you to stick with the magazine for the next month. The next month? What about my vacation? Postpone it. Not a chance. Don't you like your job, George? Well, if you want to know, I don't. I'm fed up. But you won't quit. You're part of Janet now. You like his money. You like the prestige. You'll stay. Not this time, Steve. This time, Janet's wrong. Dead wrong. I am never wrong, George. Mr. Janet. George, I have two matters to take up with you. One, a crime ways cover proof indicates that you ordered a green banner instead of a red one that I requested. The printer said red didn't fit the color pattern. Steve, would you please dismiss the chief printer on crime ways? All right. Now, Mr. Stroud, point number two. Despite the fact that you are a most excellent crime editor and a most amazing finder of missing persons, you have exactly three minutes to decide. Either you will give up your vacation temporarily... Or get out. I don't need three minutes. I don't need three seconds. I quit, Janet. I quit. When I left the building, the big clock said 5.20. I had two hours before I met Georgette at the train. And I went over to the Van Barth bar for a celebration drink. For the first time in years, I felt free and clean and happy... I was through with Janet and Steve and the whole cruel concentration camp of Janet Publications, but time was having its joke. It began with a girl at the bar, and only time knew where it would end. You're George Stroud, aren't you? She was blonde, beautiful, and expensive-looking. I'm Pauline York. Buy me a drink? Why? On the strength of losing your job. I didn't lose my job. I quit. I was in Janet's office when it happened. Hagen's intercom was turned on. Oh, so you know my deepest secrets. We, uh, we have something in common now. Like what? We both hate Earl Janner. Oh, he's been good enough. Money, an apartment. But I hate him. <laughs> Bartender, yes, sir. a drink for the lady, just like mine. Yes, sir. Do you always drink green drinks? Well, it reminds me of green ink, and today I love green ink. Janeth hates green. He loves clocks and he hates green. Wonder how he'd feel about a green clock. <laughs> George. <laughs> George, you have reason to dislike Janet. Between us, we know a great deal about him. Enough to write his biography, George. You and I. But who'd buy it? Janet. Uh uh-uh. uh. Sorry, that's out of my line. Uh, pardon me. Here's your drink, miss. Fine, just sit here. Oh, oh, all over my dress. Yeah, use my handkerchief. Oh, I'm awfully sorry. Glass just slipped. Oh, it'll be all right. George, I'm afraid your handkerchief is soaked. I'll put it in my bag. Hey, you better take this. It fell out of your purse. You wouldn't want to lose a nice check like... Uh, it is nice, isn't it? Yeah, $2,000. Signed, Steve Hagen. It's Janet's. Steve signs all his checks. It's a lovely gift. You should buy him something in return. What would you suggest? Well, I suggest a green clock. He'd really appreciate a green clock, and I'm just the guy to get it for him. Come on. Mister, this is only a second-hand store. We ain't got no green clocks. Oh, it's a shame. You have failed us both. Go hide in the corner. Sorry, Mac. George, there, that brass sundial. If we had a green ribbon... A stroke of genius. My man, have you any green ribbon? Yeah, I guess so. Tie the ribbon on the brass sundial and presto. A green clock. So we had fun and bought the green clock. And suddenly it was 7.30. 7.30 and the train for West Virginia had left ten minutes ago. Georgette, I'd forgotten. I phoned her apartment. The maid answered. She called just before the train left, Mr. Stroud. Said to tell you she was leaving. On schedule, without you. Oh, that's too bad, George. 
Well, now we might as well spend the evening together. How about my apartment? My maid's on vacation. We'll be alone. I went with Pauline. I was hurt and disappointed and sore, and I, I wanted to talk. It was after midnight when the phone rang. George, you'll have to leave. Why? That was Janet. He's coming right up. It's late anyway. 12.30. Oh, please, George, hurry. Well, we wouldn't want to make Janet unhappy, would we? Please, hurry. Here, take the sundial. Keep it from me to you. All right, all right, but hurry. Wait until you hear the elevator. Then use the stairs. I waited on the stairs, watching the elevator door. Janet stood under the hall light, looking around, and then in my direction, screwing up his eyes to see into the darkness. He saw me, but it was too dark to recognize me. Oh, she has another one. Another man for Polly. That's all I saw. I walked down the stairs and went home to bed. We've got a great story for you. I'm sorry, Steve, but I quit. I'm through. Hold on. Mr. Janet wants to speak to you. Hello, George. George, I want you to find someone for me. The trail is still fresh. But I quit, remember? Forget that, forget that. This man was in the city last night with a blonde. We know two places they visited. The Van Barth Bar and an unidentified second-hand shop. Uh, I... We have reason to believe the man's name is Mr. Green. And, uh, oh yes, he was carrying a brass sundial with a green ribbon around it. Mr. Green... I was Mr. Green. Me, George Stroud. And Janet was out to find the guy who was playing around with this girl. And when he found him, he'd wreck his life. There was only one person who could cover up my trail. Pauline York. There wasn't any answer. I tried the door. It was open. Pauline was there. At first I thought she was wearing a red bathing cap. But she wasn't. Something had happened to her head, and she was dead. I was shocked, but I wasn't scared. I wasn't scared until I glanced at her clock, which had fallen to the floor. It was smashed, stopped at 12.15, 15 minutes before I'd left her apartment. I did some more looking around. Three things were missing. The sundial, the check that had been in her purse, and my handkerchief. I tried to think... I can only think of one thing. Janeth. He was afraid. He was afraid because he'd murdered Pauline York and because he knew someone had seen him enter her apartment. Pauline must have told him the man's name was Green. Her last joke. Now Janeth was tracking him down. And when he found him, he'd pin a murder on me. Time. I needed time to think. I had to stall Janice, stall him long enough to prove that he'd killed Pauline. And the only way I could do that was by working at his side, by helping to frame myself for the murder of Pauline York. You are listening to Screen Directors Playhouse production of The Big Clock, starring Ray Milland and Maureen O'Sullivan, and introduced by the director of the film, Mr. John Farrell. You are in San Francisco. The cable cars are crowded. You, bristling with energy, decide to walk up that steep hill to your hotel. What a climb. Finally, you make it. Tired, hot, ringing with perspiration. You enter the bar. A little blue sign catches your eye. Oh, brother, Pabst Blue Ribbon. Finest beer served anywhere. Yes, during these hot July days, you're just one of millions of men all over America to whom that Pabst Blue Ribbon sign means welcome relief. For Pabst Blue Ribbon does something more than quench your thirst. It gives you taste. 
blue ribbon taste. The kind of taste you can't get anywhere else in the world except in that Pabst Blue Ribbon bottle. And fortunately, you can get that Blue Ribbon bottle all over the world. Yes, you hear it everywhere. In San Francisco, in St. Augustine, in Seattle, in San Antonio. Pabst Blue Ribbon. Finest beer served anywhere. Your taste will tell you why. <laughs> Now back to our screen director's production of The Big Clock, starring Ray Milland and Maureen O'Sullivan. The Big Clock said 10.30 a.m. when I reached the Janeth building. Janeth was revolting against his master, Time. He'd made Time stop for Paul in York. If he could, he'd make it stop for his only witness, for Mr. Green, me, George Stroud. And I needed time, time to think. But Janeth wouldn't give it to me. He told me to start the search immediately, and I had to do it. Time, the big clock spitting out the seconds. Time, the wheels turning, the wheels that locate missing men. Time, if I only had time to make Janeth crack, but how? And then the information started coming in. We're on our way, George, on our way. The man Barth Hatchet girl remembers a guy in a gorgeous blonde, and that guy fits our description of green. The bartender won't be in for another hour. Time. I needed time. Where was Pauline's check? Mr. Stroud, a witness saw a man answering Green's description about 10.30 last night with a blonde four blocks from the Van Barth. The man was carrying a brass sundial tied with a green ribbon. Time. It was moving faster. The sundial. Where was the sundial? The bartender remembers the guy, George. Says the drink was spilled on the girl. She used Green's handkerchief to soak it up. Time. If I had to find my handkerchief. They've traced the sundial to a second-hand dealer on 3rd Avenue, a man named Cole. Time. Time. It was running out. The second-hand dealer's on his way over, George. Time. 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 Well, George, when do you think we'll have him? It's only a matter of time, Mr. Janeth. Only a matter of time. Only a matter of time. And every second made Janeth safer, covering his trail and cutting off my retreat. Now they knew almost every move Green had made. Green and the blonde. They were linked together tight. Like the lid of a coffin. Mr. Cole is here, George. Who? The second-hand dealer. Oh, where is he? Reception room B, third floor. Alone? Yeah. I knew you'd want to talk to him. Thanks. Don't make a sound, Mr. Cole. You. You're the man they're looking for. You don't frighten me. I don't know what you've done, but you don't... Dragged him into a broom closet. He'd get out soon. Just a matter of time. Now think fast, George. Think fast. Now is the time to hit, and hit hard. But how? I went to Janet's office. Where is this man, George? Where is he? I don't know, Janet. But a powder room attendant at the Van Barth has identified the girl. And? Her name? It's Pauline York, Steve. Did uh, you talk with her, George? No, I couldn't. She's dead. I see. You don't seem surprised. <laughs> George, why do you think we've been conducting this search? We uh, know about her death. We haven't informed the police because we feel we can be of public service and at the same time secure an excellent story for crime ways. How'd you find out about it? Uh, why, uh, her maid. Her maid found her. My apologies. My maid's on vacation. We'll be alone. Her maid? Yes, uh, she phoned Steve. Here. Why Steve? <laughs> Miss York was a protege of his, wasn't she, Steve? Yes. Yes, that's right. I see. Then Green didn't necessarily kill her. Why, it, it could have been Steve here. Well, that's absurd. I phoned him at his home last night about 12.30. Within a few minutes of the murder. How do you know, Steve? A clock broke in the struggle. Oh. Then you've been in her apartment. Of course not. The uh, maid reported it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the maid. Yes. So Steve was in on it. He'd been in her apartment. He was protecting Janeth. Time. 
I needed time, and the big clock was turning. I went back to my office. Mr. Stroud, your wife was here. I sent her to Steve Hagen's office. He isn't using it, and we're off to visit here. And that's the story, darling. Every bit of it. Oh, but, George, why haven't you called the police? And face a murder charge? Janeth will have all kinds of alibis. George, Janeth must have taken a cab when he left her place. Have you checked the cab drivers? Cab drivers? Mm -hmm. George, yet you're wonderful. Janeth might have slipped up just this once. I... Oh, Donald, I'm out of cigarettes. Do you have any? Right here. Oh, never mind. I'll take another Steve's box. George, Janeth must have taken a cab. He... George, what's wrong? There, in the cigarette box. It's a handkerchief. My handkerchief, the one that was in Pauline York's purse. George, oh, here you are. Hello, Steve. The second-hand dealer says he was assaulted by Green right here in the building. We have him trapped. Oh, George. Special police are guarding all the exits. The second-hand dealer, the bartender, the hat check girl are scrutinizing everyone. Well, I guess we've got him. And, George, Janeth has ordered the guards to shoot to kill. <laughs> Darling, listen closely. Uh, yes, George. You'll have to check the cab stands. Find out if a driver picked up Janeth after 12.30 last night. Where will you be? In the clock tower, in Janeth's big clock. Right. Time. Passing the seconds around me. Time to live and time to die. And only the sound of the electric generator that makes the clock go round. Nice blue sparks. Power. Power enough to kill. And the seconds go by. Time. The sundial. Where was the sundial? Time. The sundial. The clock. The clock. Here. That's it. George. Here. The fool, Georgette. That clock-crazy fool hid the sundial here in the big clock. Oh, you found it. There's bloodstains on it. This sundial killed Pauline York. Oh, George. Look out. Get away from that generator. It's oh, dangerous. All right. I checked the fare records of the taxicab company. Janeth was driven to 612 Sutton Place. Steve. That's Steve's address. Georgette, it fits. When Janeth asked Pauline about the man she'd been with, she taunted him into an egotistical rage. Mm -hmm. He killed her and then ran to Steve. Steve came back to the apartment, set back the clock, tore up the check, and took the handkerchief and the sundial. Mm. And Janeth was just crazy enough to take the sundial from Steve and hide it here. Oh, but they're hunting you, George, to kill you. Georgette, yeah. find Steve and Janeth and bring them here, and hurry. All right. See here, George, what are you doing in the clock? Mr. Janeth, Steve, our search is over. We have our murderer. You found him? Where? Right here, Mr. Janeth. Steve Hagen. Me? Why, that's preposterous. Is it, Steve? No, you're not Mr. Green, but you did murder Pauline York. Your motive was blackmail. Her bank will verify the fact that she deposited checks signed by you. The man's handkerchief she used at the Van Barth has been found in your cigarette box. The cab company has a record of driving the murderer to your address. That's it, Steve. Yes. Steve, I... I'm sorry to hear this, but, uh... I want you to know, Steve, that I won't let you down. We'll fight this through for you, no matter how much it costs. Are you insufferable egomaniac? You think I'll continue to shield you now? George Janeth killed Pauline York. He's... Oh! Janeth! Oh! Stand back! You're through, Janeth. I'll run. I'll get away. I'll run. Yeah, he tripped. George, the generator. Well, he's dead. Electrocuted. Guess you better call the police. We waited for the police in the lobby, Georgette and I. And I wondered. I wondered if perhaps Janeth hadn't defeated his master. Time. The big clock had stopped. Janeth had stopped it with his body. Stopped it at midnight. The end of a day. And the beginning of a new one. <laughs> Have 
just heard the last act of The Big Clock. In a moment, our stars, Ray Milland and Maureen O'Sullivan, and our screen director, John Farrell, will return to the microphone. Hollywood has changed in the past 15 or 20 years. Today, you'll find that many of the movie stars live in simple, modest homes, tend their own gardens, even in many cases, cook their own meals. When they entertain, like as not, they'll sit around in their backyards, just like you and me, with good friends, good conversation, and good cold bottles of Pabst Blue Ribbon. Everything in perfect taste, Blue Ribbon taste. And it's that Blue Ribbon taste that makes this internationally famous beer so popular, not only here in Hollywood, but all over America. Yes, you hear it everywhere, in New York's famous restaurants, in Wisconsin's beautiful summer resorts, in Colorado's cool vacation spots. Pabst Blue Ribbon. Finest beer served anywhere. Your taste will tell you why. Now here again are our stars, Ray Milland and Maureen O'Sullivan, and screen director John Farrell. Well, Maureen, how did you like renewing acquaintances with the big clock? Oh, fine, Ray, except that my part always reminds me of a donut. I'm in there around the edges of the story, but in the middle, nothing. <laughs> well, Maureen, John Farrell's the director of the picture. Why not complain to him? Don't be ridiculous. She can't. Why not? Well, we might have an argument, and Maureen might get angry. And if she gets angry, she might leave the studio and go home. And do you know what she'll find at home? What? John Farrell. I'm married to him. <laughs> So what's the use of complaining? John, I haven't a complaint in the world. Working under your direction has been an exciting privilege and very much an education. So thanks, Johnny, and good night. And good night, Maureen. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. And good night to you, Ray Milan, Maureen O'Sullivan, and John Farrell. Remember, tomorrow begins another weekend. Two wonderful days to picnic on the beach, swim in the lake, or just relax on your own back porch. Be sure you have plenty of Pabst Blue Ribbon cooling in your refrigerator. Enjoy your holiday with friends and neighbors and Pabst Blue Ribbon. Finest beer served anywhere. Your taste will tell you why. Next week on Screen Director's Playhouse, Pabst Blue Ribbon presents Yellow Sky, starring Gregory Peck. The Big Clock was presented through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, whose current release is The Great Gatsby, starring Alan Ladd. Ray Milland will soon be seen with Hedy Lamarr in the Paramount picture Copper Canyon, directed by John Farrell, whose next release for Paramount will be Red Hot and Blue, starring Betty Hutton and Victor Mature. Included in tonight's cast were Bill Conrad, Larry Dobkin... Doris Singleton, Tony Barrett, Jewel Rose, Eddie Fields, and Dan Riss. Kenneth Fearing's novel, The Big Clock, was adapted for radio by Richard Allen Simmons, and original music was composed and conducted by Henry Russell. Screen Director's Playhouse was produced by Howard Wiley, with dramatic direction by Bill Karn. Listen again next week when Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer presents... Screen Director's Playhouse... Production, Yellow Sky. Director, William Wellman. Star, Gregory Peck. Screen Director's Playhouse is brought to you by the Pabst Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Newark, New Jersey, and Peoria, Illinois, and sent your way with the best wishes of the Pabst Blue Ribbon dealers from coast to coast. James Wallington speaking. <laughs> This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.